From the KSL Broadcast House, this is Sunday Edition with Doug Wright. Thank you for joining us on Sunday Edition today. Once again, coming to you from my home here in Holiday, Utah. It's been quite a week in the state of Utah. First of all, we have uh, this time with a governor's proclamation celebrated not only Pride Week in the state of Utah, but also June has been designated as Pride Month. We'll obviously be talking about that. We also want to talk with the very first Republican challenger to Senator Mike Lee's seat in the United States Senator, and that's our former legislator, Becky Edwards, who will be joining us on the program. But there's an issue out there right now that is not only affecting us here in the state of Utah, it's affecting a big, big part of the country. And that, of course, is the drought that, what is it, 36 uh, percent, I believe? Something like 36 percent of us are experiencing in this country right now. Uh, so severe that the governor of the great state of Utah has asked for all Utahns this weekend to pray for rain. By praying collaboratively and collectively, asking God or whatever higher power you believe in for more rain, we may be able to escape the deadliest aspects of the continuing drought. Please join me and Utahns, regardless of religious affiliation, in a weekend of humble prayer for rain. Many of us are big believers in the power of prayer, but at the same time, many of us believe that the good Lord expects us to do our part as well. So what can we be doing in order to truly make a difference? And when we decided to talk about this, I thought, I thought about uh, Jean Shawcroft, who is a commissioner with the Upper Colorado River Commission. Uh, Jean and I have talked over the years in, uh, when he has been in other capacities as well. First of all, welcome to Sunday Edition. I appreciate you uh, making yourself available so we can tap into your expertise. And I'm going to ask the straight up question, Jean, how bad is this drought? How does it compare to concerns of the recent past? Doug, uh, that is a wonderful question, and I can tell you that, for the most part, this is the driest year on record. There are um, indications, as I look at information about Lake Powell, that this could be the lowest runoff into Lake Powell on record. We're talking about um, as little as 2 million acre feet potentially running into Lake Powell, which is normally about 7 million acre feet. Uh, Lake Powell's at about 34% capacity right now, and uh, that also will, uh, will likely, by the end of the season, be the lowest elevation in Lake Powell since the reservoir was filled for the first time. So we are in extreme drought and uh, tracking likely the lowest water year on record. Wow. How is that going to affect some of our upper reservoirs that are in the tributaries, some end up in the Colorado River. But I think of our recreation opportunities and so on. Now, that might be the least of our worries. But when we look at Jordan L and we look at uh, Pine View and we look at uh, even Flaming Gorge, uh, how is it going to affect boating, fishing and the recreation that we love at this time of year? Well, obviously, all of those things will be impacted, Doug. There's no question that as we look at water levels, they're all down. They're much lower than they have been in recent past. And uh, as you show some of your pictures around the state, there is a lot of room between the high water elevation and the uh, elevation of the water at the current time. Um, I can tell you that the upper basin states, which are Utah, Colorado, uh, Wyoming, and New Mexico, are developing a drought response plan along with the Bureau of Reclamation to deal with the bigger picture issues on the Colorado River as we speak. This is such a huge issue and so much water is guaranteed to the lower basin states, uh, primarily California, but Arizona as well. And Utah gets a percentage of kind of what is left over after the guarantees. Uh, is this the year when we really might see the flaws in the original uh, Colorado, Colorado River Compact that was forged back in the 1920s? Are we going to pay some price here in Utah and the upper states? 
Right now, the, uh, the lower basin states, the state particularly of Arizona, are in a priority system where they would experience the first cuts on the river, and they are experiencing cuts this year and will have to cut back. There will not be any cutbacks on the, from the Colorado if, issues in Utah yet this year, and primarily that has to do with the large amount of storage that we have in Strawberry Reservoir. Um, but for that large reservoir, mm -hmm. we, we could experience some shortages uh, this year on the Colorado River. Boy, thank you. Central Utah Water Project that you and I have talked about many times over the years. Maybe we could bring this down to people's homes, our front yards, our backyards with so much water. If I remember correctly, it's somewhere around 80 something percent of Utah's water is used by agriculture. What can us real folks in our local communities do and how big of an impact can we have? Doug, that's a, that's a great question because all of us can do something and frankly should be doing something. Um, the, some of the smartest things we can do are, for example, if we typically water our lawn twice a week, then cut back to once a week. If we typically water our lawn three times a week, cut back to twice a week. The lawn may be a little bit brown. It may not look as healthy as we would like, but that alone will make a huge difference as we move into the future, and everyone in that regard can do a little bit. You know, it's probably important to prioritize what we water. For example, watering trees, shrubs, perennials, the annuals and ultimately our turf. Our, our turf can experience quite a bit of stress without having any problems. We can, we can raise our mower blades so that we're mowing three or four inches instead of one or two. That will make a big difference. And of course, there's a lot of information on slowtheflow.org for ways to understand small things we can each do to make a big, big difference collectively. Just very quickly, a, a final thought. Uh, we're hearing many communities put some real teeth into some of their requests for the use of uh, less water. Do you anticipate that this could be the year when people really do get warning notices and really might get fines? You know, Doug, that's, that's, it, it's interesting because each local water purveyor, each community, that sends out bills, so in other words, whatever group you get your bill from, whether it's city or district or whatever, they will have a lot of specific information to your local area. As you can imagine, there's not a one size fits all across the state of Utah. So please look to your local water purveyor for specific things that can happen and that you can do. But yes, I believe there it's serious enough this year that there will be some cities that will, will, be, will be in a position where they will be issuing fines for noncompliance um, as we look for ways to save this precious resource. Gene, I always appreciate your willingness to join us, and I hope that we can uh, call on you again as we work our way through this drought here in the state of Utah. Gene, thank you again for being part of Sunday Edition today. Now, coming up next, we're going to talk with a former state legislator who is going to seek the Senate seat, which is currently held by Senator Mike Lee. During the past week, former state legislator Becky Edwards announced that she was going to seek the Senate seat in the state of Utah that is currently held by Senator Mike Lee. And Becky Edwards, always a great pleasure to chat with you. You and I have discussed many things over the years in various capacities in which you were serving. But now as a candidate for the Senate, I, I like to ask this question of candidates, what was the tipping point for you? This is a big commitment, a lot of time from friends and family, money, everything else. What was the tipping point for you? Why are you running for the Senate? You know, thank you for having me on the show. First of all, it's great to be with you. For me, uh, I really have, have built my entire career as a public servant on the idea of making a positive impact in the lives of people and the prosperity of this state. Uh, I did that by 
developing a reputation as someone who was a really good listener and worked for problems with bringing anyone and everyone to the table to make solutions for some of the most challenging things Utah families and businesses are facing. As most Utahns have, I've noticed politics uh, becoming more divisive and dysfunctional and really feeling a deep disappointment and concern about that. Things need to change. I think we can make a difference, and I'm really looking forward to uh, doing that very thing in the U.S. Senate. Before we talk about some of the specifics of what you would love to be talking about during the campaign, let's talk about the process itself. Utah, uh, since Senator Lee was first elected back in 2010, things have changed with the way you get on the ballot. And with Senator Lee, of course, uh, his initial foray into the Senate was uh, accommodated by the caucus convention system. Things have changed. Is that going to work to your advantage and to others who choose, and we suspect that there will be others who want to take on Senator Lee, to actually be able to get on the ballot? How big of a factor is that for you? You know, we're planning on, on taking both routes, the delegate route through the convention system, as well as signature gathering. I think they both serve really important roles. During my 10 years of legislative service, I had three primary elections of the five I ran, and two were delegate only. One was after SB 54, the signature gathering uh, was an option. Two of them were, sig were delegate only, and I loved that process. I loved getting out, mingling, with uh, and meeting with delegates. In one case, it was state delegates and other county delegates and sitting in those living rooms, talking, reasoning together, listening to concerns and, and trying to figure out what, what our options were in terms of making a difference and moving things forward in a positive way. I think the delegate process has some definite benefits in terms of meeting with folks and the signature gathering also provides an opportunity to take that uh, that position to a wider range of, of individuals around the state and say, hey, sign this paper, let's get some, some additional folks on the primary ballot. So we're gonna do both and I see benefit and have uh, benefited myself as a candidate uh, both directions. So we're looking forward to it. You've already mentioned the divisiveness that's going on in our country. I look at the extremes on both sides of the political aisle, the extreme left, the extreme right. How do you envision bringing the, the folks in maybe a little bit toward the middle to at least you can discuss, you mentioned the word reasonably sit down and talk with folks to actually perhaps principally, you know, with, with the principled compromise and good discussion, bring people to the table, maybe with even a handshake and a smile rather than the, the viciousness, honestly, that we are envisioning and seeing today. You know, I think most Utahns just simply want leaders who will listen and, and work for solutions, act reasonably uh, in a civil way, in a principled civil way, but yet compassionately. And I think it's very possible that we can do that. In fact, during my 10 years of legislative service, every Saturday during the legislative session, I'd open up our house, we'd bring people in to, to our living room and sit down together. I'd listen to stories, learn from people's ideas, and we would work together on solutions. That was every Saturday for 10 years. Great relationships were built from those conversations. Pieces of legislation came from those conversations. I think that's the type of uh, thing that we like to say it's the Utah way. That is, that's how Utah does it best, and that's what I'm about. That's how I do it best, and I've had 10 years of doing that very effectively and, and enjoyed that in the Utah House and looking forward to doing that in the U.S. Senate. The partisan fighting nowadays by some, and I'm not putting this at any particular person's doorstep, some of our viewers very well may, but when people seem to be hanging their elections, their reputation, and the reason you should vote for me because of the rancor that I've created and the partisan division that I've created, how do you overcome that? And as you fight for the Utah Senate seat, now held by Senator Lee, what are some of the issues you'd like to discuss and perhaps de debate with him? 
You know, I, I look forward to, to taking some of the things I'm hearing from across the state uh, to, to a debate and to a conversation with, with the incumbent and certainly stand by the ideas and, and really the requirement that people have that we do have civility in this position. This does not mean 100% agreement. It means having conversations that are solutions-based and sitting down and reasoning. It takes time. It takes patience. And quite honestly, I, I have the temperament and the desire to do that very thing. Uh, I think people are looking at this, this rancor as just being downright ineffective. That's the real problem, is we are sitting as as a state with with one of our current representatives who is is not at the table having those conversations about how to do things better uh simple votes of repeated no is doesn't doesn't actually move us forward doesn't provide much needed help for utah families and small businesses and i think people are thinking there's a better way that's what we're intending to provide is a better alternative and going to uh, again the the history of my working on issues that really matter to everyday Utahns, jobs and wages, uh, education, healthcare, affordable housing, the climate. These are things that that do matter in people's lives, and and I made a habit and a priority of working on those very issues during my service. Becky, we've enjoyed the conversation, and we'll look forward to more conversations about the Senate race uh, with you and others who are participating. Thank you again for joining us on Sunday Edition. Thank you very much. It's been Pride Week uh, here in the state of Utah. Actually, June is Pride Month, declared by Governor Cox. We're going to talk about that coming up next, what we learned and what will happen in the next year. Stay with us. Rob Muhlman is joining us right now, and he is the executive director of the Utah Pride Center. And, of course, this past week, primarily in Salt Lake City, Pride events were going on. Rob, thank you so much for joining us this morning on Sunday Edition. And maybe you could just give me a little quick overview. How were things this year? We've, we've had, you know, 15, 16 months of COVID. What effect did that have on the Pride events this year? You know, I think that that time gave us a lot of opportunities to think about what Pride was going to look like this year. And it was an incredible series of events, very well thought through, I, I think, and purposeful in the decision-making around wanting to highlight leadership, wanting to highlight the connection with the um, faith community, wanting to bring communities into our spaces, and then, of course, wanting to rally and march together and raise the voices of our um, queer Asian communities, our queer indigenous communities, our queer Latinx communities, so, and of course our queer trans communities. So it was a remarkable series of wonderful events. And I think one of the big changes, other than you know Pride itself, the Story Garden, was the fact that for the first time ever in Utah's history, we had a Pride Month proclamation from our governor. And that is significant. It has meant a lot to so many people. And I think that that might stand out as the key defining feature of pride for, for me this year. I was going to ask about that because to anyone's knowledge, and there have been organizations and individuals that have really dug into this. And boy, I've been covering uh, you know Utah news for a long, long time. I could never remember a governor doing anything even remotely close to this. But Governor Cox... Uh, did, again, not just Pride Week, but June being Pride Month. And if you put that in perspective, you mentioned it's, it's certainly a big deal. I think we all agree on that. But how big a deal was it? And what kind of doors do you hope that a governor's proclamation in Utah will make for it? not only the you know, gay community, the, the various terms that are used, LGBTQ community, but, but for us all, how big an impact? Well, I think there are two parts there. The impact was huge. And I think that that can be judged by watching the reactions on social media, certainly my own very emotional reaction when I got the news a few days earlier that he was going to be doing something like this. And you read how surprised, appreciative, amazed, and, and grateful 
members of the LGBTQ community were when they saw and heard about that proclamation. And then I think, secondly, your point was around the doors that might get open. And, and what Governor Cox, I believe, has done and what individuals like the um, incredible Mayor Aaron Mendenhall do, when they lead and when they purposefully say words like we see the LGBTQ community, we want to do better, we want our spaces to be inclusive, and we recognize that you have been here in Utah forever, that is important. It places pressure on other individuals who are elected or in leadership positions to do better, to think about their constituents. So when we talk about that very short, succinct, powerful proclamation, I do think that it is going to have ongoing effects. And, and I am so thankful to the governor for what him and his incredible team did, led by Nubia Pena at the Multicultural Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, for the final moments that we have on the program today, Salt Lake City has been pretty much the epicenter of some of the events and the efforts that we have talked about, although certainly we see you know, a, a more friendly environment everywhere. But how rapidly do you anticipate or do you believe that this now will spread events in other cities, maybe some parades, things of that nature. Is it going to have a contagion, as it were, especially now that it has that uh, proclamation at the state level? Doug, I'm not sure that after a pandemic you should be using the word contagion in any sort of sense, but yes. Exactly. I like where you're going with, <laughs> I like where you're going with that. <laughs> yes. So we, we do partner with other pride um, organizations across the state, and we hope that with the work that we do here in the Pride, um, the Utah Pride space and the Salt Lake Pride, that we are able to assist in, and help drive change in other spaces. There's a Logan Pride, there's a St. George Pride, there's a Trans Pride, there's a Provo Pride, there's a Leather Pride, all the way through um, in many different spaces in Utah. And so I think that it is going to put pressure on those mayors in those towns to be the next group of people to say, in our town, we also see our LGBTQ brothers and sisters and teachers and cousins and doctors. So, you know, I think that we love that as, as the Utah Pride Center and as the Salt Lake sort of basis, we are able to help our fellow organizations um, in creating some of the change in those spaces. And, and we also know that there is some important change that needs to happen in those spaces because we have individuals coming into mm -hmm. Salt Lake and, and telling us about their lived experience in um, rural Utah or um, you know, other spaces um, certainly around us. Rob, I, I so appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much. And I look forward to what I hope will be a great conversation about this and some of the changes and some of the things that have really taken root perhaps a year from now. And that does it for Sunday edition. We're out of time. Music and the spoken word is coming up next.